Hello and welcome to Shark Talk. In this episode, I chat with Gillian Morris, marine biologist and founder of Sharks for Kids. We're going to be talking all about great hammerheads, about lemon sharks, shark conservation and shark science. And Gillian is also going to be answering some of your questions. So don't go anywhere. You're watching Shark Talk. Well, Gillian, welcome to Shark Talk. Um, you do some amazing things for shark conservation in the world of outreach, science, education. So really looking forward to talking to you about that and of course about the different shark species that you work with as well. So thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much um, for having me. I'm excited to connect with you and I just, I think these opportunities to connect people from all over the world and chat about the things we love are amazing. So thank you for, for making this possible. Not at all. Uh, now, your work has taken you all over the world. I mean, you've been to very diverse places and seen many different species of sharks, but you're based in Bimini in the Bahamas. So why Bimini? Uh, so there's a couple of reasons. I mean, really, uh, the Bahamas is the shark diving capital of the world. So if you are a diver and you want to swim with sharks, you've at least heard of the Bahamas if you've not been there. Uh, if you've watched a television show that has sharks in it, you've probably seen the Bahamas. Uh, you can kind of see behind me really clear water, loads of different species. Uh, so if if it's something you're passionate about, you're probably going to end up there. And that's what I did. I ended up there. There's a research station on Bimini. And so I ended up passing through and then doing some projects with them and then uh, traveling all over the world, but kind of kept finding myself going back to the Bahamas for various film projects or research. And, and then finally just said, right, I want to, I want to be here. I want this to be my home and I want to have sharks in my backyard. And I've heard you say in the past that sharks have really shaped your world and shaped your life. But I think it's fair to say that you do so much for sharks in return. I mean, it's, it's very hard to encapsulate everything that you do and have done. So let's start with, and my necklace might give it away a little bit. Uh, let's start. Let's snap. Let's start with the great hammerhead. An incredible, incredible shark and right up there on my list of sharks that I'd love to see in the wild. So can you introduce us to some of the great hammerheads that visit Bimini? Yeah, so the, the great hammerhead is, is a pretty incredible species. Um, they're very iconic. If people know a shark, uh, or maybe they only know a couple sharks, they probably know hammerhead. They maybe don't know it's called a great hammerhead, but they know that shape. Uh, it's very unique. Um, and they're just, there's nothing else like them. And I've always had a fascination with hammerheads. Uh, I had a really cool encounter years ago diving uh, off the Florida Keys and just had one cruise in and kind of really slowly, they're pretty skittish for the most part, um, and swim and leave. But just, you know, those, it was probably like three seconds. I don't know, it seemed a lot longer, but it was probably very short and just being mesmerized. And so having, you know, seen them and tagged them, but then Bimini has become world famous for being able to dive with these sharks. And there's just something magical about, I mean, shark, any shark in the water is incredible. It's an amazing experience. I wish that everyone had the chance to, to experience. But when you see this animal with this, you know, this massive head, these eyes out on the side, I mean, it's not like any other shark, any other animal in the world. And their presence, their bold, their, I mean, just their personalities. We spend enough time with the ones in Bimini that you do see their personalities. Uh, and so just such, I, I don't know, I'm just so fascinated by them and so grateful to be in the water. And, you know, now they're a critically endangered species, um, which is heartbreaking because last year, it just shows you how quick this happens. Last year, endangered species. That's terrible. This year, critically endangered. All right, next stop, extinction. What, you know, that there's not a lot of room for error. And it just, I believe that we can save them. I believe that that's possible, but actions have to happen now. And I think there's a sense of urgency when all of a sudden that, that change happened and that status changed. Um, but yeah, just uh, to me, the most amazing creature on the planet. And just tell us a little bit about their migration to Bimini. So when do they arrive and why do they arrive? And just paint a picture for us about, you know, why they're frequenting that area. So in the in the winter months, the water gets cooler. So we tend to see them 
slightly December, January, February, March are kind of the main months. Uh, it kind of depends on how cold it gets, how quickly. And I know people are going to the Bahamas, it gets cold, really. No <laughs> one feels bad for me when I'm like, in the winter, but I wear a seven mil suit in the winter. It's, you're sitting on the bottom. It doesn't matter. It's colder than your body temperature. So it's, it's but no one, everyone's like, really? <laughs> there's, there's no sympathy. Um, <laughs> So the cooler water, they're coming from deeper uh, and they're coming up into the shallows to feed. And, and so it's, um, we're kind of happening to be in that space that they might be utilizing. Um, maybe they're spending more time there now because there are free snacks, but it's definitely not enough food for them to rely on. They're still going to have to be actively hunting. Uh, but stingrays are on the sand flats, it's, you know, smaller sharks they're coming up to feed on. So uh but a lot of the work like the lab is doing right now with some satellite tagging projects is to understand, you know, where they're going after, where they are, where they're coming from. Um, and, you know, how long are we, are they staying in the area? Is the provisioning affecting? Do they arrive earlier? Do they stay longer? I think it's going to be really interesting to see over the next couple of years as the data continues to be collected. And we'll get a little bit further into the science and how you do the tracking and the tagging and things a bit later on but um before we move on to the next species just quickly i know that you've come to know and love some of the great hammerheads that you've dived with so can you just talk us through a couple of them and you know some of their traits and how you id them for sure so um scylla is my favorite animal on the planet and uh she's a shark that showed up in 2015 yeah the end of 2015 um originally called bite back because she had a huge bite mark on the back right near her caudal fin and uh very creative name but that's where, <laughs> uh, the, the dive was like she has a bite on her back we're gonna call her bite back and then now the lab has given greek names to, to all greek gods and goddesses to all the to sharks uh so scylla is just spent a lot of time with her uh and then it was sad she left us and went to tiger beach for a couple seasons and so everyone got to see her she's very unique um if you've seen markings like a great hammerhead she has very unique markings on her underside um she's she's on instagram she's very famous <laughs> uh, but we just had those moments with her and actually she returned um i saw her in december uh she the dog shop said we think it's her and you know we were checking and making sure and the first dive like I was so anxious to get out because I just wanted to see I wanted to see it been two you know like two years uh since she'd been gone and I teared up in the water when she passed because it was just like ha huh. and and it was just such a cool thing one that she'd survived two that she'd come back uh she had a pretty significant injury to her dorsal fin um not sure what from, but uh, it's healing now, but I mean, it was kind of flapping a bit, but you know, they heal incredibly quickly. So she's got a big scar now, but uh, just really bold personality. Um, and yeah, just amazing to have that connection and to see that with an animal. Another one that I really love is Ampertrite. And she's got a really big personality. Uh, she just comes flying in. She's really bold. Like here, hey guys, I'm here. There's no quiet approach. She just comes slamming in, and and you know it's her even before you can tell it's her from the distance. Just the way she's swimming towards you, you're like, here she comes, and she's usually the first to show up. Uh, you know, as soon as you get out there, and and yeah, so it's just like, okay, she's here. All right, we're gonna have a good dive. Last year, sadly, he didn't show back up this year, but the name mangle mouth which is an unfortunate name but his mouth was mangled like it obviously had been caught and damaged jaw broken um to the point that assume probably didn't make it because couldn't feed very well like if the food didn't go in just the right spot like basically down the throat it wasn't able to close the mouth to keep things in so probably not able to very easily capture things um didn't return that a lot of them don't return but with that significant injury but yeah spent a season um seeing him on the regular and and so that was you know we hope you hope that one comes back because chances are he didn't survive we don't know but I would assume with an injury like that not not going to survive mm. I've got to say you know when you were just saying about Scylla and how anxious you were to get back in the water that actually gave me goosebumps because it really does bring it home that they're out there every day trying to survive and they've got a myriad of things against them. You know, they're, they really are the underdogs, which is, you know, contrary to what a lot of people would think. Yeah. You, you want to root for them because you do know that life is, so when they're in Bimini, it's pretty awesome. They're getting free snacks, hanging out, you know, um, 
everyone's getting their photos for the gram, right? Like it's, it's that, but then they leave and there's all these risks and just trying to, you know, take away the human impact, but just surviving, finding enough food um, and a mate and, you know, all these things that animals have their natural sort of process. And then now, you know, we're, we're messing with it all over the world with animals land and sea, but yeah, you just, you root for them. You want to see them survive and come back. The next species that we're going to talk about is the lemon shark. Probably not, you know, up there with a lot of people's favourite sharks that may be the great whites or the tiger sharks or, you know, the big hitters. But lemon sharks, underrated. Tell us about them because they are gorgeous. Well, you can see behind me, I'm a big fan. Uh, Vimini, again, really special because we have them from birth to adulthood. So another critical area. It's why the Vimini Shark Lab was developed. Doc Gruber, who has sadly passed away, um, he set it up as a research station just to study the species. Um, really, really incredible. A lot of the things that we know about sharks, uh, particularly as far as behavioral or even anatomy, uh, life history things, are because of the research done with this species. So uh, yeah, maybe not quite as glamorous or as excited as some of the others, but super important as far as our understanding of of sharks in general and we have them you know the nursery areas the females come back if you guys have seen um bbc shark amazing program uh very informative beautiful footage i will say my husband worked on i worked on it as well i have some footage in there too but my husband spent a, a lot more time working on it but just the other footage and just a really well done documentary on these animals and so the big pregnant females in the spring kind of come back to Bimini to give birth and they'll get as close to the mangroves as they can get in very shallow water uh, to, to give birth. Then they leave. They don't take care of the pups, but it's really giving these babies the best chance of surviving to get into those mangroves uh, where they can hide, uh, find food. So it really is a nursery area, absolutely critical for this species, that, that first kind of stage of their life. And having seen a lemon shark give birth was uh, probably the coolest thing I've ever seen. Um, they're connected to the mother with an umbilical cord. So they do have a little belly button kind of scar when they're first born, uh, which I love sharing with kids and adults. It's one of my favorite facts, like that little lemon sharks have belly buttons. One, because I think it lets us connect to sharks in a way that maybe we don't think there's anything similar. Other, Okay, we have eyes and, and a mouth. But yeah, so and, and kids always get really excited about that. And just seeing them born and start that life and have to immediately be a shark, be on their own. Um, but they're, they are. They're, I mean, they're capable of taking care of themselves. They can swim. They can hunt. They can hide out. They have all the same senses. They're just a mini version of, of mom and dad. Um so yeah, seeing that, spending time in the mangroves with, uh, you know, these are kind of sub-adults or teenagers behind me, but uh, yes, kind of hanging out with them in all stages. The cool thing too is females go back to the place they were born, um, just like salmon people. That's probably the most common animal people think of that. And so, um, you know, they're showing this this site fidelity, but they're coming back. And I think that's really, really incredible. And with the, the nursery and the way that the pups do all congregate together for, for an amount of time, do other shark species do that? Or is that quite a unique behaviour to the lemon shark? Um, well, we see we also see juvenile nurse sharks in there as well. And you'll see them kind of stacked up and they're hiding in the mangroves. So it really depends. I mean, you know there are nursery areas, not necessarily uh, a mangrove habitat, but you do have regions where pupping happens and then you're, go you're going to see the juveniles and, and understanding where that happens because for most species, we have no idea where that happens. Um, and so we're, that's a really important habitat to protect. So if you, if you can only protect a species during a certain time of year or maybe a small region, if you know that they're pupping there and those little sharks are staying in that area for a certain amount of time, you definitely want to get those regions protected, a season, uh, you know, and figure that out. Because if you don't and somebody goes in and you wipe out, you know, a whole you know, that season's pups may, you know, it could be 50, could be 100, 200, whatever it is, um, or you see habitat destruction of that area, you're going to affect that whole population um, because you, that next generation isn't going to be able to grow up and then, you know, have their own pups. 
And that leads me on to, you know, how vital science and research is so that you can get that data and that information and try and implement ways to protect those specific areas. Can we talk about workups? Because I've seen lots of pictures of, um, you know, sharks next to boats and, and ropes and tags and all sorts. But it would be great if you could just talk us through what a workup is and, and how it happens and, and the process. Yeah, so uh, I think... You know, a lot of times if it isn't explained, it looks a little like, what is happening here? Why did the shark tie to a boat? But really, uh, everything from start to finish from the equipment that's used to actually catch the sharks, the hooks, the, the method of pulling them into the boat and working them up is done with the sharks. It's designed to make this as efficient and easy on the animal as possible. And you hear of you may you know, people talk about the animals getting stressed and you know no they they don't have a big exam or a race the next morning or you know they're anxious it's the chemicals in their body that can build up when they fight on a line uh, that can actually cause them to die and so you want to be very aware of that it's it's different in each species as well and so the method of capture what kind of equipment you're using will vary depending on the species based on um, a couple of things like one if they're a shark that can buccal pump they can rest on the bottom and just pump water in they don't have to swim to breathe great hammerheads have to swim to breathe very sensitive animals so scientists are constantly working at new methods that are not like less invasive for studying them from using lasers to measure them taking biopsy samples with just um kind of a modified spear gun taking a little bit of that skin without catching the shark um so yeah kind of developing methods to be less impact on the animal it's brought next to the boat it is secured with a rope that's really to make sure the animal's not thrashing around to hurt itself and also we want it right next to the boat so that we can collect our data quickly and let the animal go. I mean, the whole thing, everyone knows their job. Everyone knows exactly what they're going to do. Uh, and you do it extremely quickly. And it could be, depending on the tag, it could be, you know, five minutes to anywhere from about 12 to 13 minutes uh, for some of the tags that are a little bit more involved in putting on. Uh, but yeah, you want it to be done as quickly as possible. Get, get them back, get them moving. Um, things like is the boat anchored if it's a species that can you know breathe uh, with by pumping the water or do we need to leave the boat in gear and slightly moving forward if it's a species that needs that water moving over the gills you may have seen people like pumping water in if they're you know depending on the setup and uh, and then you take things like measurements uh, pretty standard tip of the nose tip of the tail tip of the nose to the fork in the tail so that kind of top and bottom split and uh tip of the nose to where the tail starts also girth measurements sort of where the shark's armpits would be if they had armpits and, and throughout kind of assessing the health of the shark also if it's a female and she's of a certain length right you know she's sexually mature and then if all of a sudden she's quite large maybe she's pregnant um sometimes you can feel the pups uh they also now have ultrasounds that are in water which is amazing to see uh there's some really cool videos out there where you can actually see the little pups inside uh this toothy little baby inside wow that's uh, amazing really, yeah really incredible and then taking a clip of the tissue from the dorsal fin and and that's used for a couple of different things one you can look at the dna it's giving you the dna of the shark which you can do a shark family tree so something where all these lemon sharks are in bimini uh, the lab has over 30 years of um, a family tree uh, re relatives that's how they know like the females come back so natal phylopatry like they're coming back to the place they were born also um, that when a female lemon shark gives birth to a litter of pups there may be several different fathers so understanding that uh, and you know things that you might not have thought of before so and the dna is giving a lot of information uh and then also something we call stable isotopes which is essentially you are what you eat it applies to sharks so looking at the different compounds that are in their system that have come from the compounds that we know or the mounts in different fish or other animals really just to figure out where in the food chain they exist they're not always on the top we can use a little bit of muscle tissue kind of just below the dorsal fin blood work and then that dna sample uh, to look at the stable isotope to really understand their diet what are they eating what role do they play in that ecosystem and then um other people may be swabbing the gills to look at bacteria or the teeth it kind of then it goes on to there's other variables depending on the specific project and then the shark's tagged 
and, and tags could be uh, as simple as if you have a microchipped pet at home in case they get lost, we use those for sharks, same exact thing. It's a little chip, it's injected just under the skin. Uh, and that's, you know, if we catch a shark, we can wave that scanner. And, okay, you know, have we caught this one before? When did we catch it before? Um, and then those are kind of basic. If people have seen cows or pigs with those plastic tags in their ear before, uh, roto tags, we use those on the dorsal fin. It's really just a, a way of giving a name tag, an ID. Uh, then you start to move into some pretty incredible technology, satellites, tags. Um, I actually, I have one here, but. Oh, brilliant. So, yes, from show. See, this is when it gets a little weird. Like I gotta figure out exactly where <laughs> I put it, show it. So the satellite tag is, is attached to the dorsal fin. Um, these have to go on sharks that come to the surface. It's got a little sensor here that needs to touch the air to transmit. Okay. Uh, the green bit is a computer and then you have batteries so that goes on and anytime that shark comes up to the surface it needs to be on a tiger shark a white shark uh, a mako something that does come to the surface and it will transmit a gps location so if you've heard people talk about tracking sharks this is one of the tags they use there are also pop-off satellite tags that collect the data and then pop off and float to the surface uh, but new versions of that tag, uh, scientists, engineers are always working at new methods to attach these tags, collect data, again, making sure it's not impacting the shark swimming. But ultimately, if those tags, that data we're collecting means the survival of the species, science is, you know, it's critical for conservation. It has to be there. You cannot go to a government and say, I love sharks, we have to save them. They're gonna go, cool. I like sharks too. Great. But when you go with data and go, this is a critical nursery habitat. We know that every year at this time they come and pup here and there's going to be all these pups. We have to protect that. Or is it going to be an MPA, a marine protected area, a shark sanctuary? Is there going to be regulations on fisheries management? So this data is critical for getting those laws that are put in place for IUCN status, for CITES, trade regulations, um, and also for, uh, you know, regional fisheries management. Yeah, absolutely. And as long as it's done right and it's done with the animal's best interests, then, you know, as you say, it's, it's a vital piece of work. And another thing that's very important for the conservation of sharks is educating the next generation, uh, which is something that you do an incredible job with. Um, please tell us about Sharks for Kids. Yeah, so uh, it's it's really become my world. I do wear a lot of hats, but uh, most of them somehow connect to, to teaching kids about these animals. And I just, I really believe that kids can make a difference and kids are much more powerful than they realize. Uh, if I was walking on the beach and I saw a guy throw trash, you know, people are walking, they throw trash on the beach and I say, hey, pick up your trash, I'm probably going to get an unfriendly gesture or a comment. <laughs> uh, a five-year-old says, hey, man, you dropped your trash, pick it up. Uh, probably going to pick it up. They're going to feel bad about their life decision and, and that. So kids make an impact. They also inspire other kids. So if we can get them excited with the facts versus the fear that they're being taught in other places or that we're all taught, we're all taught to be afraid of these animals. And so if we can give kids facts, get them excited about all the diverse, the different, the weird, the wonderful, the little guys, the glowing sharks, the amazing camouflage, all the things that you might not be aware of, uh, then they grow up making informed decisions, they're more responsible consumer, sustainable choices, the way they vote. Um, and no, a five-year-old's not thinking about how they're gonna vote, but if you give them that information and they grow with it, then when it comes time to vote, they, they, they've they seen that their whole life. Um, so that's really what Sharks for Kids was, was born out of. And also just um, making it easy for kids and teachers to have access to free resources to learn. You don't have to be a marine biologist. You don't have to live near the ocean and you don't have to be a scientist of any kind. Like this matters for everybody. And it's really our way of saying we're all connected. We're all connected to the ocean. This is the animal we're going to use to have that conversation. We're going to talk about these animals and show how we are linked and how we're connected to the ocean every single day, no matter where we live. 
And as you say, you provide materials for teachers to use in classrooms and for children to get hands on with colouring in and books and things like that and lesson plans. But also you do Google Hangouts and video classes as well, don't you, and workshops and things. And I've seen some of the Google Hangouts and it's amazing. The look on the kids' faces, they are transfixed. Yeah, it's it's really incredible. I mean, obviously we love getting into the classroom our team is all marine biologists we're all divers conservationists different backgrounds our core team founders uh my husband who is a marine biologist now videographer and then my best friend who's a marine biologist uh, i sort of said we're gonna do this <laughs> and uh and so all of us have that science background and then we've brought in other people from but we're all passionate about sharks that's that's really what it comes down to and we wanted to share that passion and isn't there a book didn't i hear that's just been launched that looks amazing yeah so really excited uh, it actually comes out june 4th so it's pre-order now and my husband and i wrote it. it's called shark superpowers and it does have some of the regular more common species like the great hammerhead but it's got a few in there that I think kids have probably not heard of. And uh, we just really want them to get excited about deep sea sharks and different species, some of the smaller sharks, because these animals do some really cool stuff. So that's, we have a link for that information on the website, but it's, it's Shark Superpowers. It's a, a British publishing company. And really excited that Steve Batchel did the forward for us. Yes, um, I saw that. Yeah, he's a friend and we've done quite a few shoots. My, my husband shot with him for years now, over 10 years now. So they've done a lot of um, film shoots together. And, and uh, Steve's a big ocean and shark advocate and lover. So it was really quite an honor to have him get involved as well. So, um, Right, I have some questions for you. The first question is from Lauren Swatton. And she says, how do sharks' personalities differ between species and which species do you identify with the most? Uh, you don't necessarily have the comedian or, you know, uh, the loud mouth, but you do sort of have the bold. And, and a lot of them are in sort of feeding situations, like which sharks come in and they're really bold. People have this idea that if you go in the water or there's food in the water, that all these sharks immediately come flying in and they don't. You know, some days we go out to either try and catch and tag sharks or to film them and we don't see any sharks. So uh, that is, a, you know, a challenge in itself. So um, when we talk about personalities, it's usually kind of the ones that are a bit more bold. They come in a bit quicker, uh, shy. And, and these are still us sort of putting our terminology on mm -hmm. it. Uh, and, and so they might kind of hover in the distance for a while or maybe one that tends to spend more time with a particular shark. Uh, and so versus one that is a bit more solitary. Um, that's a good, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I would say hammerhead just because I, I love them so much. And I would think that I would want to be the hammerhead. <laughs> um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know that it's anything about my personality. I, I think I tend to be a bit more bold and out there. So maybe one of those ones that comes in like Amphitrite, I'm here, guys. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not a very shy person at all. Next question from Freddie Holman. He says, the thing I love about the ocean is how much is still unexplored. Do you think there are species of shark that are still unknown to humans? Absolutely. And new ones are being discovered every single year, which I always tell kids, if, if you're interested in sharks, you might grow up and discover a new species. Wow, That's amazing. Yes. The ocean, yeah, right. So the ocean is still a place that we can truly be explorers. Humans can go still go to parts of the ocean that no one has ever seen before and discovering new species, which really comes back to we have to take better care of the oceans. We have to protect it because there's so much we have no idea about. Absolutely no idea. So yes, new species. Um, you know, if you guys saw the pocket shark, uh, and it's not that it's necessarily they just found it. It may have been found and they figured out using DNA and, and analysis that it isn't the same species. Um, but it would it's would fit in the palm of your hand and uh and they're called pocket sharks not because they would fit in your pocket uh because they have little pockets behind their pectoral fins i didn't that know that i thought it was because they were small no, they've got <laughs> little pockets that squirt out glowing liquid i mean just like the cool how is that not the most amazing animal and they're this big and they're deep sea and we still know very little about them but they have little pockets i That's mean that amazing. is 
I, yeah, I, they're like my new obsession. Yeah, Pandora's box of delights. Next question from Halai Wangamati. What is the current single biggest threat to sharks as a whole? Um, it's humans. I mean, really. Uh, and then that that's a, uh, there's a lot of components to that, but you're looking at targeted fishing for fins, but it's not just shark finning. Meat consumption as well. Shark, people eat shark. So that's another threat, particularly um, you think of in the UK, fish and chips. Big piece of advice, ask what, if you eat fish, what is the catch of the day? This is anywhere in the world, but what is the, you know, white fish? Uh, shark is used as a cheap protein in a lot of places. And so being aware of that, um, they're also caught as bycatch in other large scale fishing industries, which means they're targeting one fish, but they're catching dolphins, turtles, sharks, other fish, um, coastal development. So wiping out those mangroves, which unfortunately we see a lot of in the Bahamas to develop hotels or casinos or, um, and the mangroves, we've seen it in Bimini, mangroves gone, just gone. That habitat is gone. Not some portion left, it is gone. Um, recreational fishing. Uh, so kind of sport fishing and, and targeting these as prize game fish. Uh, so yeah, and, and then pollution in the ocean. They're not immune to it. I, mean, we've, I last year dissected a shark that had washed up on the beach dead and, and uh, plastic in its stomach. So we see them tangled uh, around, you know, lines caught on them, debris. So it's all, it's all human impact. Final question. Can one person make a difference? in terms of shark conservation? And if so, how? Absolutely. And it's it comes down to like what I was saying earlier about being overwhelmed with what's happening in the world and how do I do it? And yeah, every simple act, really, it's not just the act that you take, that, that piece of action, but it's what it also inspires others around you to do. So I'd say the biggest things for shark conservation are first off, educate yourself understand about these animals, uh, find out what's happening locally uh, or globally and both. But, you know, I think finding out what's local as well is there's this idea that shark issues are, are other places or, you know, they're not happening in my own backyard. They probably are. All right. Find out if shark is on the menu. It's at the grocery store. Uh, go to the pharmacy and find shark cartilage pills, shark liver oil. Okay. This isn't something, you know, happening on the other side of the world, it's probably happening in your own backyard. But that also means that actions in your own backyard can make a difference. So I think education is first and foremost, learn the facts, learn what's going on. If you're a diver uh, or not a diver, if you're not a diver, I'd say learn to dive if you can, or at least go snorkeling, see these animals, get up close, go swim with sharks. And you might go, that sounds crazy. I promise you, it'll be one of the coolest things you ever do in your life. And you'll want to do it again. And you'll see they're not many monsters. If you don't believe what I'm telling you, and what other people are telling you, go see it firsthand. Um, Gillian, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to chat all things shark. I always love talking about sharks. And thank you for putting this message and sharing this with other people as well. Not at all, not at all, a pleasure. And um, maybe we'll have you back on Shark Talk to talk about more species. I'd love to. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for watching everybody at home and uh, we will see you soon. Goodbye. Bye.